Daniel, you've written a book called A Rough Guide to the Dark Side. Sounds dramatic. Well, it is, and uh, the experiences that I'm talking about were dramatic. Um, I was a young reporter at the New York Times. I quit my job, decided it would be more fun to organise a music festival in Belgrade, which is where I was living at the time, and wound up embroiled with Balkan gangsters. Uh, and the whole experience was so chaotic and confusing that I don't really know what happened, and I've, despite writing a book, still not got a very clear idea. Right. So uh, there's a lot in that. You quit the New York Times, though, uh, the world's most famous newspaper, to, to run a music festival. Tell me about that. Well, it was a surprisingly easy decision to take. Um, I had felt at the time that I was uh, basically being offered the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh, I joined the Times in 2002, age of 27. And uh, it was right after September the 11th, the terrorist attacks on America and a time of great patriotic fervour in the American news media. And uh, I was totally uh, oblivious to this, being young, naive and uh, extremely ambitious. So I signed up, found myself in a backwater in the Balkans where there wasn't really much that they wanted to hear from, from my part of the world apart from whether or not the Serbs had agreed that they were bad guys responsible for the Balkan wars of the preceding decade. And the way in which they, they were deemed as a nation to be collectively guilty and really responsible for, for, for heinous atrocities was that they all signed up, like the Nazis supposedly, uh, to a policy of uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide. And uh, the intellectual culture, particularly the media, were massively responsible in hoodwinking people into believing that this was a good idea. And of course, I was supposed to be writing this in the New York Times at the time that they were printing a load of bogus intelligence material to facilitate the war in Iraq and going out of their way to make that war more possible and convincing everybody else that because their reports were taking it seriously, the bogus intelligence information was to be taken seriously. So the two didn't really add up for me, I'm afraid. So, come on then, uh, are you calling the New York Times uh, hypocrites? I'm not really calling them hypocrites as such. Um... They are a very serious newspaper. They report from all over the world, uh, and one can be well informed reading their news pages. They've got more foreign correspondents than most newspapers, and they spend a lot of money uh, on hiring good people to tell them what's going on. But they do that in a way that is particularly skewed, and it's skewed towards the American official worldview, and that's hardly surprising. And in places like Serbia, everybody takes that for granted. Uh, most people who work for the New York Times don't like to think about it too much because they assume that they're free-thinking individuals. And to a certain extent they are, but they also know the right thing to think. And uh, I started to not think that way and became alarmed at the way in which I was expected to think, uh, which was basically to promote the interests of the American elite. And my editors, who were the people who I was supposed to be uh, instructed by, were so proud of the fact that they did that, 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 that one of them, the most senior editor at the paper, even wrote an article in which he boasted, basically, about being the editor of a paper that was uh, foghorning establishment propaganda, as if that was its role and natural duty. Um, and I, I was pretty, uh, pretty alarmed by that, really. You're not in a totally strong position to be making these points, though, really, are you? I mean, you say in the book that you, you even made up some quotes on one stage. They, they made it onto the front page of the newspaper. Yeah. Um, I did that. Um, I did wrong. I can't really defend it. It's true. Uh, I have to say, though, at the same time that I can understand why I did it, and it also I don't think it was that big a deal in contrast to some of the other misrepresentations of reality that go on every day in that newspaper, and not just at the time of the war in Iraq. That's not to say I can defend making up quotes. I, I was lazy. Uh, I was busy trying to organise a music festival. I had to write the front page story at uh, very short notice. And so instead of going out into the street to interview people, um, I uh, interviewed my translator in my apartment and gave her a fake name. Now, as I say, I can't really be defended, but um, I think the reason that I, I, I found myself thinking that I didn't care much about that was because of the uh, the scale of journalistic depravity that I'd seen at the Times at that time, and also the fact that I didn't really feel like I had any kind of mentor there. I was a one-man foreign correspondent operating out of his flat, and uh, there was nobody to turn to for guidance. And instead, actually, I found some, uh, some more interesting things to do and, and, and some more inspiring role models. But, I mean, it kind of helped much that you were stoned off your face most of the time, from what I can understand in the book. 
No, I mean, being stoned all day probably didn't help me behave like a good New York Times employee, that's true, but it did help me to follow my heart uh, because I only really could be bothered to do the things that I believed in. And uh, so I felt liberated by uh, my chronic cannabis habit, which I had back then. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, it led me into uh, some, some, some questionable decisions, let's say, in that you know, I liked to think that I was uh, more alive, more free thinking. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, I was probably convincing myself of some fairly self-deluding ideas. Uh, and uh, it could perhaps be argued that uh, quitting the New York Times was one of them in, 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 in some ways. Uh, it was a good job. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't regret what I did, but at the same time, uh, I can see that uh, I passed up a, a good career opportunity. You talk about questionable decisions. Um, I mean, one of those for me would be um, what you did uh, in, in packing drugs up your backside, actually. You were smuggling drugs across international frontiers. Um, that seems pretty questionable to me. What on earth were you doing? I was a cannabis addict. I like getting really, really high. And to get really, really high, you have to smoke really, really good dope. And uh, in the Balkans, I was finding that I couldn't find good quality stuff. I could get local weed. I could get pretty badly adulterated hash. I wanted to smoke top-notch Himalayan charis, which um, I had developed a taste for uh, traveling in India several times when I was younger. Uh, so I would go to Amsterdam, I would go to Zurich, I would go to Barcelona, where I knew people who dealt in this stuff in industrial quantities. I would buy a large amount, I would bring it back for my own use. Now, I don't do that anymore. Uh, it's probably not the wisest thing to do. I gave myself some fairly alarming experiences in the process, but um, I was able to smoke as much as I wanted, and that made me feel very alive. Uh, perhaps, in hindsight, I would call it a slightly manic uh, kind of sense of being alive. Uh, but, frankly, those, uh, those times were among the best in my life. Um, I, I, I felt on it, I felt in the zone, and I was doing something that made me happy. And all the while, you were uh, putting together plans for this music festival in Serbia. Um, I mean, picture the scene, Serbia, uh, a land where we just come out of a horrific war, um, and you're doing a music festival. Um, that seems pretty crazy as well. You could say that, but uh, at the time, it seemed to me like an excellent idea. Uh, the first reason for that was that I'd already been to a music festival in Serbia. There was one that had been established a couple of years earlier. Uh, its name is Exit and it showed me the way out the door at the New York Times. Um, I wrote a story about them, which uh, led to me spending a week getting very high um, all day and all night and having a great time. Uh, it turned into the only positive story I wrote about the Balkans, and uh, it also gave me the idea that I could tell a positive story myself. I could uh, organize a rival event that would not be held in the province of Voivod in a little bit north and tucked away. Uh, it would actually be in the centre of Belgrade, uh, on an island called Big War Island. We were going to rebrand Serbia as a more exciting and dynamic place than anybody had ever thought. It was going to be some new holiday-making opportunity for, for disgruntled young people in Western Europe who are bored of Ibiza, bored of big super clubs. They could come to Serbia for not much money, have a great time, and uh, I'd even convinced myself we could persuade the government to decriminalise cannabis. I mean, I had all sorts of great ideas. And the main reason that I felt so enthused, I suppose, was I met a guy who convinced me this was possible. He, he firstly knew how to book bands, and secondly, he had some pretty great ideas. Uh, and as a result of meeting him, I, 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 I wasn't just fantasising. I was actually able to implement these, these, uh, these crazy ideas of my own. <laughs> Yeah, I read about this fellow, the famous G in the book. Um, you don't actually tell us his name. Why is that? Well, I'm not trying to hide it exactly. Um, it's certainly no secret who he is, and uh, anybody who knows much about the festival that we organised, uh, which was in 2003, uh, will be able to figure out who he is in an instant. Um, I was more trying to capture the nature of our relationship, uh, which was, at the start, quite confusing to me. I couldn't really work out who this guy was. He seemed pretty wild, but... Uh, his wildness was one of the most appealing things about him in that he was uh, totally fearless, really. Um, he was prepared to, to, to do something that was frankly quite dangerous to uh, try and run a music festival in Serbia without any money um, and to not be afraid of, of, uh, of, of making promises to people without any money to pay them. And, uh, you know, frankly, that was, in hindsight, the only thing that made the thing possible. And, uh, I mean, you know, in, in his debt that... Uh, he, he gave me an opportunity to do something that was enormous fun. And, and uh, at the same time, I was confused about who he was. I was confused about 
who a lot of the people we were working with uh, really were. I was confused in the end by, by my own role in the whole process because this festival didn't go so well. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of people come, 150,000 roughly, uh, but uh, there was no money at the end of it. I was told by my partner that uh, we'd been robbed by what amounted to the Serbian Mafia uh, in allegiance with the Serbian government uh, being bankrolled by uh, the taxpayers of the West. Um, I found that a little bit hard to swallow at the time. I can since uh, get a little bit more of a handle on what he, was, what he was talking about. And when I've written the book, I've tried to reflect the way in which uh, it's hard to really pin any of these claims down unless you do some investigative journalism. And in a way, I hold up my hands. I didn't do that. I, I wanted to, to show how I was at that time. I'd stopped functioning as a reporter, and I was totally at sea. Totally at sea. Uh, certainly it seemed that way at the end of the concert. Uh, this concert spiralled out of control, it seems, and, and then you quickly followed. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, it was a very difficult time in my life. Um, I had some very unrealistic expectations that we were going to transform the whole of the Balkans based on a music festival in the middle of Belgrade. Um, I also probably had the unrealistic expectation that I might get rich, that I might get famous, that I might somehow top being a young, successful New York Times correspondent, having pissed away that opportunity. Uh, but at the same time, what really happened was that I couldn't live with the reality. I, I, I'd made big claims that, 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 that hadn't come true, and uh, my, my ego was so badly bruised that uh, my already quite uh, crippling anxiety issues that were leading me to think it was a great idea to get stoned all day got stronger and stronger. I got more and more stoned, I got more and more paranoid, I became frankly suicidally depressed. And uh, I retreated to uh, a farmhouse in France uh, with as many drugs as I could get my hands on. And uh, I uh, smoked myself psychotic in the process of trying to write this book in four days, which uh, was perhaps the, uh, the biggest of my crazy ideas. And yes, it sent me pretty crazy. I wound up uh, with a French doctor injecting Valium into my backside, which is the uh, final scene in the book. And uh, I've since been trying to put my life back together, having realised that I needed to make some quite drastic changes to the way I was living it. So you didn't get the book done in four days, but you did get it done. Uh, we've nearly a decade on since that scene at the end of the book. Um, what's been going on and, and where are you going to now? Well, I've been learning some lessons, I guess, is uh, the easiest way of summarising it. I, I have uh, really had to face the fact that I was very arrogant and uh, pretty misguided in some ways uh, in, in some of the decisions I took. I don't regret them. I'm glad I left the New York Times. I'm, I'm glad I saw through the illusion that I'd bought into of, of uh, the, uh, uh, the wonderful media machine. Um, but at the same time, I still think like a reporter, I, I, I'm a writer, and it would have been easier to get this book published had I been still working for the New York Times. It would also be easier now to place uh, freelance stories I write uh, were I to be employed by a major media organisation as opposed to some guy saying, well, it's been a few years since my last byline. But, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've learned some humility as a result of that. Uh, I've also understood a lot better the processes that were driving me. Uh, I've come to terms with some of them and have stopped feeding them. I no longer get high all the time. Uh, I have, uh, have, have learned to live a, a more balanced life. Uh, I take things a lot more slowly, I think, than I used to, and have come to realise that it takes long, hard work to do something like write a book and that I can't just whistle one up out my backside in five minutes. And so I think I'm in a better position now to go about doing the kind of work that I was really aiming to do in my 20s. Uh, we'll see how it all pans out, but uh, I'm looking forward to the next writing project. So it's a personal story, it's a professional story, it's at times a very painful story. Um, it's a rough guide to the dark side, and that's Daniel Simpson. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Buy the book. <laughs>